Welcome, folks, back to Dr. Rima Truth Reports. This is one of a series of recordings of scientists and researchers answering the question of Fukushima, where are we and where are we going? Part of our Fukushima 5th anniversary marathon to be aired on March 9, 2016. I have with me Darren Colomb and Matt Presti from the University of Science and Philosophy, who are here to discuss with us uh, some of the issues as they see them and uh, the solutions that they have been um, uh, analyzing. Uh, without further ado, gentlemen, I turn the floor over to you. Uh, Dr. Rima and General Burt and I are very interested in hearing what you have to say, and I'm sure so is our audience. If you want to share screens and use a presentation during the discussion, that's wonderful. Uh, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Ralph. Um, I'm Matt Pressy, president of the University of Science and Philosophy, and we're here to basically give a demonstration on the concepts of Dr. Walter Russell, his ideas concerning the construction of matter, and how that relates to the octave wave of elements. And uh, his work with the Westinghouse Laboratory back in the late 20s, early 30s, he was able to successfully demonstrate transmutation of gases. So um, one thing I think that will help us all is to conceive of matter differently because the way we conceive of it now is what has led to things like Chernobyl and Fukushima as well as other leaking plants around the world. We simply don't understand what we're messing with as far as the elements of matter are concerned. And uh, I'd like to turn it over to our lead scientist, Darren Cullum. Uh, I do want to remind everyone that they can visit the University of Science and Philosophy by going to philosophy.org. And we hope that uh, this presentation will at least allow people to think in a higher octave when it comes to matter. Because as we all know the old saying, you cannot solve the problems of the world with the same science that created them. So we must open our minds to a higher octave if we are to be successful with radiation remediation. Darren? Welcome, Darren. And give us a little bit about your background as well, please. Okay. Uh, my name is Darren Colomb. Um, I'm uh, currently working as a uh, laboratory scientist in uh, Burlington, Vermont. And uh, I've been involved uh, independently studying the work of Dr. Ru Russell for probably over about three years now. Um, and I've um, recently in that time um, been in, working more on a practical application um, of, uh, of what Dr. Russell was trying to convey. Um, it's an extremely intricate scientific paradigm, and uh, it's, it's going to be a lot of re-education and reorientation, and I'll try to cover that uh, as much as I can today. So I'm going to go ahead and get this slideshow open here and play. Okay. Is, Is this, this working, working for you? Are you seeing this? Oh, that's wonderful. Yes. That, that's okay. part of the miracle of modern science and philosophy. <laughs> Technology, Technology, yeah. yeah. It's we have the power. Yeah. Okay, okay, so this is going to be a, a brief primer on the Russell cosmogony. Um, this is going to be uh, this is going to be a lot a lot to cover in a short amount of time. So I'll try to do my best. But um, so this this first image you're seeing here uh, and this beautiful quote by Dr. Russell: "The secret of creation lies in the wave." So we're going to be covering octave waves and the reason we're going to be covering that is because octave waves are how the elements of uh, matter are arranged and um, are a, a way a language uh, a way of conveying these ideas in, uh, in a certain type of language so this first slide on conceptual reorientation okay so we have to really think about what matter is and we have to question very basic assumptions as to how we think uh, matter basically emerges out of space and is somehow mysteriously swallowed back up into space which is not something that scientific thinkers um, all through the ages have been identifying this problem but but um, the basically where we're at is is theoretical conceptions basically we don't know fully how this happens so we 
we use theories and we, we approximate and we test to try to see if, if, if we have an understanding of how this actually happens. But in the case of Dr. Russell, we're, we're doing, dealing with something different because he was not formally educated and basically all of his scientific knowledge, his chemistry knowledge in particular, came by way of illuminations, which is not, a, not an academic way of achieving knowledge. But it is, in fact, how all knowledge enters into the human race if you uh, are so inclined to investigate. So um, if, we, if we read Dr. Russell's work, we're, we're challenged with several things. One is the language. It's, it's hard to convey uh, sort of the totality of creation uh, using words and pictures. It's, it's actually quite limiting, but we will, we will attempt to convey some of these ideas now. Uh, the first one I'd like to bring up is this idea of, um, well, the difference between cause and effect. And as you can see here, we have two images. These are from the, uh, Dr. Russell's home study course um, that he wrote in conjunction with Leo Russell his wife. And uh, so this first image I want to show you is the reality of cause. And this is the, what he calls the one, one white light of mind. So basically, if you can take away anything from this, it's that um, the totality of creation as we know it is really, it's a division of one thing. It's a division of one equilibrium into countless twos of sex conditioned opposites. Um, which basically eternally seek to void their division by uniting as one. So we're replacing the concept of matter attracting other matter, and we're actually invalidating the Coulomb Law entirely by saying that matter neither attracts nor repels one another. It's actually a divided equilibrium into two separate opposite conditions, which basically only move, uh, according to our senses, to basically void their opposition and seek equilibrium once again. And this is universally applied. This is not simply applicable to things like magnets or electricity, common effects that we're thinking of that uh, show um, self-evident polarization. This is applicable to literally every, every wave, every moving thing in the universe because motion is actually an effect. It is not cause. Cause is basically non physical. They're, they are simply attributes. It's ideas. Every single thing that is created is, starts initially as its cause, as a conception, as an idea. And we build bodies out of light to simulate those ideas. So this is an entirely different way of, of looking at the problem, any problem, because we're, we're reducing it um, back to what is, what is the initial idea because we're basically, we're working with the understanding that Russell had that the, the universe of motion is actually completely illusionary. It is only optically, optical or light-based. Light is the only thing we have to deal with. So understanding this, this uh, polarity between cause and effect will help us dramatically in understanding the universe better. So the question for our purposes here today is what is radioactivity? Uh, this is something that we should be concerned with um, because what it really is is, of course, multiplied death. Uh, what does that really mean? Well, creation is an illusion uh, and it simulates substance by multiplying the speed of centripetal motion. This is uh, getting a lot of attention because of, of vortex mathematics and things like that. And, um, but the universe also loses its appearance of substance by multiplying uh, centrifugal speed, which is what we know of as radioactivity, or this is the phenomenon of radioactivity. So radiation is, again, it's the normal death principle. Um, everything in nature dies normally by basically slowly radiating its heat. This is what we know to be as entropy. Um, but radioactivity is an, a, sort of a special class of that because it's, it's explosive quick death. Uh, it's, it's a bit like ionization. It's a rapid return to the zero equilibrium that we were talking about before. So when we discovered radioactivity, this is man discovering how the human race can destroy itself very quickly. We can help mankind die very quickly uh, if we don't fully understand what we're doing with radioactivity. So all things in nature die normally by slow expansion. 
So radioactivity is multiplied expansion, which is caused by multiplied compression because, again, we're dealing with a two-way universe, not a one-way universe. You can't have accelerated uh, expansion without accelerated compression to precede it. Uh, reaction precedes action, which is followed by reaction in a continuous two-way cycle. This is very different than what we're taught, and it's extremely different from thermodynamics we're taught, but it is actually self-evident um, by nature. You can observe these things in nature. So uh, radioactivity is basically making it harder for bodies to live by increasing uh, their death or releasing the tensions which make them die. As I was saying, compression is the, the opposite uh, reaction to um, expansion, and so we can think of it as a type of tension. In other words, it's difficult to live because you have to uh, think of standing up straight. You have to always maintain focus in order to hold your balance against this divided opposition. But uh, when you release those tensions, you just norm you would just collapse and fall back down. We so can think of radioactivity in the same way. I guess it's a way of looking at uh, entropy. Uh, you know, life is constantly a struggle against uh, dissipation. Precisely. And uh, we can think of radioactivity as the, it's the normal the normal rate. Uh, so during the day, I mean, you're you're you fatigue. Eventually, you become tired, and then you have to sleep at night. Imagine radioactivity as being uh, something that just sucks all your energy out instantaneously, and you become extremely depolarized, and you have to lie down. Um, when you lie down, understand that arrest from motion is what we think of as death. Nothing actually dies in the universe. It's, it simply lays down for a period of rest to again stand up again, uh, to become polarized. So these polarizing and depolarizing continuous two-way cycles are, are the fundamental principle in the universe. Everything is interchanging in this way. So now this brings us to uh, more of a discussion on what is matter. So matter... Again, if we're consider, let's just consider the universe as e nothing but equilibrium, right? A flat surface of water, no no tensions, nothing. Well, then matter actually is an abnormality, because it is wave motion and o only. Um, so to have motion, you need to have two. You need to have a pair. You need to have a pair of opposite conditions that can interchange with one another, such as the crest in the trough of a wave. One is plus an equilibrium, one is minus an equilibrium, and the two interchange. But in Russell's uh, deeper understandings of these things, um, he actually considered the crests and the troughs to be actually pos both positive extensions and the equilibrium being the minus extensions. And this has a lot of implications for the way that we look at everything from chemistry to electrical engineering. To Imagine if your to battery... Homeostasis. To homeostasis in terms of how bodies respond to uh, to things like radiation that are pulling them off of homeostasis. This exactly. Yeah, got it. Even you, even your own breathing, your your in breathing and your out breathing, uh, consider them both positive expressions. And when you're taking the zero, the zero would be basically the fulcrum in the middle or the point where your your interchange from in breathing and out breathing. You're right. It's a zero. It's like when you throw a ball up in the air. It leaves your hand and then it hits a point of suspension at zero and then falls back to your hand at another point of zero. So it's these two extensions, but in the very middle is the point where the potential is, is reversed. It's a reversal of potential. And this is what is known as the fulcrum in Russell's writing. It's, it's the universal equilibrium that exists between all mutually extended things. And this extension is applicable to every, literally every pair of polarities in the universe, whether it be light or dark or in-breathing and out-breathing or male and female. So it's, it's literally the totality of polarity, which is an extremely valuable uh, piece of information for science to understand. So anyway, so getting back to wave motion. Um, basically, normality of the universe is, is a condition of rest, as we've said. Matter is not in equilibrium, as I've just explained. It's, it's a divided tension, and so it creates uh, conditions which divide a resistant equilibrium, and that is, sets up tensions. Tensions are not really a normal thing for the universal equilibrium, and uh, so they have with them, they carry with them the desire for relief from, from tension, and this is how decay or discharge or explosions and flame 
basically give matter that relief. Uh, matter really actually wants to explode. It's because it's being compressed into uh, an abnormal uh, condition, kind of like running uh, an electric arc through a vacuum tube. It's, it's uh, an abnormal condition because the vacuum tube represents universal equilibrium in this example. So this is a whole different concept of what matter is because now we're saying, okay, well, it's matter's not really held together from within by some mysterious force within the nucleus. Uh, it's actually compressed from the outside in, just like a tire is. Um, and this is actually proven by, if, you, if you've ever seen, uh, like using high magnetic fields to pinch matter into a plasma, they're for, they're, you see you're forcing it from the outside in. And when you do that enough, you create a compressed condition and the reaction to extreme compression is expansion, which, which is what we consider to be heat or energy. So uh, basically all matter then and under this conception is basically pressure conditioned motion. It's motion that is confined to a certain volume and varying this? pressure conditions. Do you see this related to the Big Bang of that moment of, of nearly infinite compression well so the big the big bang uh concept came out of this idea of entropy um this this heat we we have this conception that that heat is energy and so there must have been some initial explosion for this energy that we see everywhere because what we do is we look out in telescopes and see all these balls of fire out in out in the sky and we we say okay well everything's expanding that as far as our senses can tell us, so it must have all converged at some initial beginning. But again, remember, self-evident, this universe is two ways. It's a two-way cycle. There cannot be a downhill flow of energy without without an uphill flow preceding it. Also, well, that's so why, a big, that's why Dr. Edward Tiller, for example, came up with the concept of these two universes: the uh, what he calls the electromagnetic and the magnetoelectric universes that interpenetrate. But um, that's another that's another story entirely. Uh, bring us, bring <laughs> well, us sure. Back you, to this. And, you know, uh, Dr. Russell wasn't the only person to 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 uh, have this knowledge. Uh, I do believe he had this knowledge in, in far greater detail than most. But this concept of uh, a zero universe is not uh, it. It, it permeates all sorts of fields. It, you can find these types of ideas in spiritual writings of the East. You can find these ideas in lots of um, lots of different scientific avenues uh, that are not necessarily purely academic, um, because as you know, just you asking the question about the Big Bang, you know, it's uh, it it means that it means that we have some conceptual things that sometimes go against mainstream accepted ideas. Big Bang being one of them, but again, as it, if we're talking about um, energy and matter, um, the cons and, and this type of conceptual uh, orientation, then uh, there, there must have, well, so the Big Bang was an explosion, which means heat, but it must have been highly compressed, meaning it came out of the cold of space. So even if you believe in the Big Bang, you still have to concede that energy comes from cold rather than heat. So it's a if we're using some logic, then you know we need to re revisit these uh, these accepted laws of thermodynamics because we can actually be counter we can be counterproductive or we can be invalidating some statements uh, by not fully understanding uh, you know our um, our accepted criteria for these things. So anyway, but I just want to get back to pressures. Uh, so varying pressure conditions yield varying states of motion. Okay, so. Again, we're, we're saying we're dividing an equilibrium into two, two opposites, but those opposites are conditioned, and those varying states of condition uh, or varying uh, states of motion are what science misinterprets as the elements of matter, and we'll we'll get more into that. By the way, this image here on the right is uh, one of Russell's called analysis of the harp string, and what what you find in his writing often is that he's trying to convey something using analogies that are familiar with you. For instance, a harp string. When you look at a harp string and before you've plucked it, it's basically inert. It's completely motionless. And this represents the zero universe. When you desire to transform an equilibrium into something that is dynamic and will produce sound, 
how does it begin? It begins by you plucking the string. In other words, your own mind desire creates everything. Well, indeed, including... it was Pythagoras who, using the monochord, uh, d developed the first, you know, numerical philosophy in human history. I guess. So yes, exactly, exactly. <laughs> yep. So, so what Russell's showing here is that basically there is no difference between sound and light. They're both they're both uh, light waves. Now, I'm I'm saying light, but it, you know. You can take me to mean in this instance uh, just incandescence or what we think of as light. And Russell had a much different understanding of light because he understood invisible light versus visible light, mm -hmm. which are two two separate things. Just as we're talking about a zero universe and a multiplied divided universe, so this this vibration harp string uh, here we see uh, that is a beautiful example of the spiral principle, which is what we need to uh, to understand the octave, the nine octaves. So this spiral is ubiquitous pattern in nature. We see this everywhere, and it 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 is the the spiral direction, as I mentioned before, centripetal and centrifugal. These are the spiral directions of how energy runs uphill, and also runs downhill. Um, so this winding up and winding down are the cycles uh, in the universe, which are ubiquitous, and we see them everywhere to every system, every living system. So. The entire universe is a living system. <laughs> um, okay, so now let's just, we have that under our belt. This is uh, going to briefly cover the nine octaves, uh, nine octaves of the elements. And uh, Russell copyrighted his charts in 1926. Okay, that's before they found deuterium, tritium, neptunium, plutonium. So he is actually the, the rightful uh, discoverer, even though he wasn't the guy actually in the lab that did it. But he, he produced charts that predicted elements, okay? Mm -hmm. That should give you an enormous red flag that he knew something that common science did not or does not still um, because he basically went around and lectured and then from a few tips that he gave certain people led to the discovery of, of plutonium, deuterium, tritium, all of, the, all of the elements that gave us our atomic age. And this is all... Um, well documented. It's in the introduction of um, Atomic Suicide. Leo Russell wrote a beautiful introduction because, you know, when they wrote Atomic Suicide, uh, they, you know, people were going to be like, well, who are these people? They're talk they wrote a whole book on atomic energy, but um, they're not scientists. They're, you know, they're, they're painters and philosophers. But, I mean, <laughs> when you read the introduction, you see that, that Dr. Russell was... Uh, the man that was basically single-handedly gave the information that led to the discovery of all the atomic uh, fission and fusion elements that were using um, in the, that were used to make the H bombs and uh, everything. So we basically owe uh, the inception of all of this knowledge from from him, even though he does not receive the credit for it. So, but in what way? So, in what way does this knowledge help us uh, deal with the events that happened five years ago? Oh, well, we, we will absolutely get to that. <laughs> Let me, I guess I should just keep going because that's exactly yeah. where we're going to get. Um, so, uh, but yeah, so, so since Dr. Russell was the source of this information, well, actually, not he himself. He, I mean, he basically, when you read about his illumination experience, it was he became one with God. In other words, he became one with universal source, and that is the source of all information. Regardless, um, we, we have this myopic view in our science where, you know, we think we can only get to something by deductive reasoning, but that employs the use of the senses and the senses are extremely deceived. Just think about walking on, on the planet and you, maybe you're walking down railroad tracks and you see that on the horizon, they all converge to a point. Okay. But you know, that's an optical illusion because you can just keep walking and eventually you only ever find parallel tracks. They never actually do converge. So we know that our senses are, are not actually giving us the whole picture. Um, and when Dr. Russell had his experience, he basically was no longer subject to the senses. In other words, he had full, full comprehension of how the universe works by removing himself from the seat of sensation. So when he came back and tried to give this to science, it was just completely rejected because it's, it's conceptually so far ahead of where we are right now um, that nobody understood it. And, and I do mean nobody. I mean, he, he sent out the Universal One to all, all sorts of places, and, and uh, it was largely ignored. Um, 
And, uh, you know, he kept trying, but, it, but, you know, no one, no one really, really understood and applied what he, what he had to say. And so we have an opportunity to do that now because since he, he led to the discovery of these radioactive elements, um, let's, let's hear what he has to say about how we remediate these things. And this is basically why Atomic Suicide was written. It's a phenomenal book. Uh, I recommend that you read it um, to everyone that, that hears this. You should read it. So anyway, uh, let's get back to this, the nine octaves of the elements. So uh, I know, uh, you know, I came, back, came from a traditional academic background. And so when I read this next sentence, I had a hard time chewing it because I, you know, I was just coming out of chemistry, advanced chemistry courses and everything. But in reality, uh, carbon is the only element. There's only one element, and it's carbon. That's so all, yeah, all of the other elements are basically different names and uh, that are given to the stages of carbon's evolutionary life cycle. As I, I've said before, there's it's a two-way universe of continuous cycles, and the only cycle that we're concerned about with the elements of matter is carbons, because carbon is every every element that we think of. So, and this, the reason for this is because um, the elements as we know them are basically, we're, we're only aware of the elements within a certain pressure zone. As I mentioned before, there's, there's tension from compression in a vacuum, which is basically what the planet is. It's compressed matter or motion inside of a vacuum, which is what we, what we know as space. So, but, you know, we live on a, a certain uh, equipotential strata on the surface of the planet, and that, that corresponds to uh, a pressure zone. And so all the elements that we can test or tactily touch or uh, do any kind of heat manipulation or anything with is basically only subject to our particular pressure zone. If you were to take do chemistry experiments on Mars, for instance, the results would be extremely different because now you're in a different pressure zone. You see, so it's there's these all these layers of strata of different uh, electrical potential around every center of gravity, and so the elements um, are basically all the attributes that we know of them. Their their heat, uh, their um, belt, uh, moit, uh, melting point, their boiling point, their density. Uh, all of these attributes are basically a result of their motion within a certain pressure zone. So this is extremely uh, valuable to science, uh, to uh, chemistry because we've we've documented all of these attributes, these physical attributes. But what we're really doing is recording uh, one set of variables of one one particular condition of motion in a certain uh, electrical potential. So it can change and it can vary and you know, there's, there's some evidence of that. So um, I wanted to point out, you see here uh, where this line is carbon, right? So you see on this line, and this is one, one way of putting the, the table of elements together. There's many others. There's a spiral from a side view and a spiral as if you're looking down it. Uh, those are the Russell charts one and two. Um, but this one is kind of more easily to understand because it looks like a fretboard of a guitar. So it's giving you the this this concept of everything is basically a frequency or or a vibration of motion. Darren, you your can see... audio is breaking up a little bit. Just to let you know. Oh, okay. Let me just turn this down. I might be clipping on my end. You do. You're doing good. Now you're doing good. Okay. Um, so. Uh, because I want to, I want people to understand this. What I mean by non-amplitude elements. So what I basically mean here, you see this line. It says athenon, quenton, hydrogen, and carbon, and silicon. So this line, I'm going right across here. This is what's known as the amplitude. It's 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 the crest or the trough. You can think of it either way. But basically, the zero the zero equilibrium exists in one particular plane. And as motion is extended in both directions from that plane, they're forced or compressed to collide. And that is what we know to be um, the wave crest. It's right when you, when you pluck a string, the sound actually occurs at the, at the crest and the trough. And so it's an explosion outward from two compressed points coming at each other um, from opposite directions. And so that's how the elements uh, hydrogen, carbon, silicon, cobalt, rhodium, lutetium, all of them 
those particular elements are basically the collision point, which means that they're also the reversal point of their octave. Now, every octave is wound up from an inert gas, and inert gases uh, pervade the entire universe. We don't have this understanding in, in our current chemistry because um, the only thing they've recognized is that these inert gases basically don't don't unite. They don't form chemical bonds with anything else. And Russell explains this in more detail than anybody because he knows what they actually are, are the, the zero. It's their, They do exhibit certain things like a physical pressure. We can compress xenon in a tank, for example. But in, in chemically speaking, they are they're the zero of the octave. So all elements that are compressed together come out of an inert gas. And so the inert gases themselves basically are like, you can think of them like seeds. And all all the elements of matter in various pressures and various octaves come grow out of an inert gas, basically. And they're projected from it, um, from, from two opposing octaves. Um, uh, so... What else can we say about that? So um, you can see this red and the blue here. Uh, this is denoting the denoting the male and female again because everything is sex divided. In fact, I mean, without getting into the super details, but I mean, even if we just consider the sex principle in terms of matter, um, this will help us a lot because we don't generally think of elements being male or female or yin and yang, even though, I mean, it's, it's actually makes a lot more sense. You see sex division in plants. You see sex division in animals. We don't think of sex division in, in polarity of light, and we don't think of it in the, in the, um, the elements of matter. But this, this sex principle is universal because it actually goes back to the, the Holy Trinity. It's you basically, like I was saying, you have one, the one, one thing. You have one equilibrium, one static uh, fulcrum of non-motion, and then you have the two divided. So this is just as applicable to the elements as it is to biological life. And this made a lot of sense to me because I'm actually a biologist. Uh, so <laughs> when, yeah, when, you, when you're looking... Um, you, you see male and female everywhere, even if you don't think you are, right. you know, I understand, and... That, and I understand how that fits into philosophy. Uh, we have a, a time slot issue that we have to move forward. on okay. Because we're, we're trying to get as many different opinions as we can in the marathon. And uh, we've scheduled half hour slots. You guys are uh, over that. And I really want to hear from you specifically about how these ideas, which are powerful ideas, sure. <laughs> apply to what we're facing in, in Fukushima. Okay, so let's get right to that then. Um, so new concepts for remediation, uh, and this is going to be the idea of transmutation. Um, so the entire secret of creation is within the wave, uh, specifically optical waves. And so if we know how this, this process happens, then we know how matter is constructed uh, because it's the only mechanical unit of creation that, that creates all matter, regardless of what it is, whether it's radioactive or, or, or not. So we, what we're dealing with here is matter, which is composed of waves of different dimensions in frequencies and comparisons of axis and amplitude, as I was mentioning before about amplitude, um, and gravity pressure dimensions, which determine their density, as I was talking about before with layers and stratus of electrical potential. So we have this universe composed of what we think of as different elements, 121 of them roughly, all arranged in octave tones. And these octave tones are basically just like pianos or, or harps or guitars, however you want to think of it. But they are basically only difference, uh, differences in, in vibrational dimensions. Now, it may be in, in three dimensions rather than like a two-dimensional sinusoid wave, but the mechanics are identical. So like the tones of a harp, which you can actually change, you can retune it from one vibration dimension to another, you can do the same thing with matter exactly the same thing because light and sound are both the same thing which is motion so in the future with this kind of understanding our chemists will be able to basically retune elements and we can produce any element on command out of space directly at any time um, with this kind of understanding so we can manipulate matter just as much as we manipulate a piano uh, a piano note. You can take one wire of a piano and, and make it an entire octave of, of notes if you know how to sufficiently shorten or lengthen its vibrational uh, wave frequencies. And we can do the same thing. Um, 
So we need uh, funding, obviously, to do this because this is an entirely new branch of, of science that has not as forth yet been adopted into, into serious scientific study. But as uh, Matt mentioned, uh, Dr. Russell did perform experiments at Westinghouse in, uh, in the 20s, and he was able to transmute um, five cc's of, of gases into, into different substances. So this, uh, we, have, we have a mechanical method that um, we can begin researching. And, uh, well, with enough, uh, with enough uh, scientists with this understanding, we can solve this problem uh, very easily. And remediation will become extremely simple, uh, as simple as tuning a piano. And with that, I'm done. I'll, I will stop talking. Wow. All right. So transmutation. All right, folks, we've had a very interesting discussion about the nature of reality. And in that discussion, the proposal was made by the good folks at the University of Science and Philosophy that transmutation of elements is, uh, is a real potential way of dealing with uh, what we see at Fukushima. And let me remind you what we see and what we've seen in some of the images that are being uh, uh, broadcast during this telethon We've seen uh, thousands of tanks of radioactive water uh, being stored on site in Fukushima. We've seen maps of plumes of radioactive water flowing around the Pacific Ocean. We've seen images of, uh, of, of fish uh, obviously damaged by radiation exposure. We've seen images even of sharks who are not supposed to be able to uh, get tumors uh, exhibiting tumors. Uh, so something is awry in the world, uh, and we do need indeed to transmute what is wrong into something that is right. Uh, and you've helped us understand what is right. Folks, go to philosophy.org to learn more. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for uh, participating in the fifth anniversary of Fukushima Marathon at the Dr. Rima Truth Reports, www.healthfreedomportal.com. P-O-R-T-A-L, healthfreedomportal.org. Thank you.